Flashback to 2005 and the majority of us, if not all of us, were still recording video in standard F format. The Sony HDR HC1 was the first consumer grade HDV camcorder capable of recording in 1080i format. In fact, just by looking at it, this looks like less of a consumer camcorder and more of one that's either intended for prosumers or light duty professionals. I mean, first and foremost, the first thing that you're going to see on the business end of this camcorder is this lens hood that all of the HC1s came with. It just screws right onto the lens. This has a 3rd inch CMOS image sensor, a Carl Zeiss Vario Sonar T-Star lens, and 10x optical zoom with super steady shot, which is actually electronic. But one thing that was lamented by many was the poor low light performance of this model. Of course, this was from the time when night shot was still around on practically every model of Handycam. So if you found yourself in a low light situation where you just needed to get that right shot, even if it was to be in a sickly shade of green, you could go ahead and turn on night shot and use that to shed some light on the subject. Moving past the lens is the combination focus and zoom ring that depending on the placement of the switch over here, you could use that ring to get very organic looking zooms like you can with DSLRs and newer mirrorless cameras today, or by engaging manual focus and get very smooth and fluid rack focus effects because you're not just using a little jog wheel or sub setting on the touchscreen. There's three additional buttons down here, one for telemacro, which will max out its optical zoom, getting you that shallow depth of field look many strive to achieve. Then there's the expanded focus button, which will digitally zoom in on the image to assist in getting tack sharp focus. And of course, this wouldn't be a Sony Handycam without the typical backlight compensation button, which should help a little bit if you have a backlit subject. Moving even lower is a lever for adjusting your exposure and your volume, and this little button for activating exposure adjustments. So if you happen to be recording, typically all you have to do is press this button to turn on manual exposure, and use this little rocker switch and push it up and down. Likewise, during playback of video, you can simply just press the switch down or up to adjust your volume. On the top of the camcorder are two stereo microphones that are some of the best sounding ones I've ever heard to be built in microphones on a camcorder. Located smack dab in the middle of the two stereo microphones is a pop-up Xenon flash, like what you'd find on regular cameras. Interestingly, there were actually two models of this camcorder. The HDR HC1, which we're looking at right now, which was intended for consumer use. And then there was the HVR A1U. And that was intended for prosumers and, again, light-duty professionals. And the primary difference between the HC1 and the A1U is the removal of the pop-up flash and replacement with an accessory shoe, a microphone interface, and a shotgun mic on the top of the camcorder. Moving behind the flash is an active interface hot shoe accessory shoe for use with Sony accessories. On the right side of the lens is a night shot switch, a flash switch for alternating between different modes of flash operation, a rubber plug hiding your microphone and headphone jacks, your Memory Stick Pro Duo slot that's used for taking still images, a whopping 16 megabyte card is uh, what I got with this camcorder. That needs to be replaced very soon. Have the typical zoom rocker and photo buttons for taking stills. There's an LANC jack for use with remote controls and editing equipment. One thing that's nice to see is that the material that Sony made these hand straps out of is uh, of much different and better quality than what they used on these old Handycams, which just disintegrates. Funny enough, this was actually the only consumer HDV Handycam that Sony released that still used Infolithium M-Series batteries. Unlike the newer Infolithium P, H, and V-Series batteries that came after it and were used on all of the consumer HDV line, and even though Sony probably didn't intend for it to be that way and just didn't have a chance to come out with some new battery standard, well, that meant that you could use the older Infolithium batteries that were kicking around from your Hi8 and Digital 8 camcorders. Behind door number one below the LCD is a 4-pin Firewire iLink connection, as Sony liked to refer to it as, and a mini USB jack for accessing files off your memory sticks. Door number two houses your component and composite video outputs. And door number three is home to your DC input for charging. You notice something missing from this camcorder? There's no HDMI output. The 2.7 inch LCD screen does have the typical Sony zoom and record start and stop buttons. Your auto lock switch which will just uh, disable all kinds of manual controls. Then there's also the button for turning on and off the on-screen display with the camcorder powered up or with it turned off for displaying the pertinent battery info and charge level. 
Oh yeah, did I mention that this actually had a color viewfinder? Which is really nice to have when you're filming in bright lighting situations like at the beach and the LCD screen gets washed out. The viewfinder does pivot up, but it does not extend outward. The on-screen display is laid out as is typical for Sony's, along with a little visual reminder of what setting you currently have the switch set to. So in my case, this is set to behave as a zoom wheel, but I can of course change that very easily by switching that to manual focus. Then on the lower right is Sony's personal menu, which gives you easy at a glance and at your fingertips control of commonly used settings. You can do shutter speed, program and auto exposure, and something that you won't find on any of the later consumer HDV camcorders, shot transition, which in this iteration on this particular Sony Handycam, gives you the ability to do very smooth and fluid rack focus and zoom effects. For example, you could program in shot A and shot B to have two different focus points or focal points and then go to them as you're recording video and get a nice transition that you wouldn't be able to really achieve by doing things manually on the fly. Likewise, you could do the same thing with zoom. And you see how it gradually comes to a stop? Something I was disappointed to discover is that the level meter is only viewable with manual levels enabled. Now that I have it turned on, you can see the level meter showing up here. But if I had this typically set to auto gain control, auto levels, that level meter disappears. And there's no way to keep that thing on the screen if you have it set to auto gain control. Which is quite regrettable because my Canon HV20 has one. Even this older standard F Canon FS200 has one. Looking past all that other fun stuff in the personal menu for the sake of brevity, you can get into the main menu and adjust lots of different settings, spot meters, white balance, sharpness, and also a weird digital effect that Sony called Cinema Effect, which would replicate the look of 24 frame per second video. Because this came from a time period where the majority of people that bought this camcorder new still had standard def equipment everywhere, there is the option in the menu to enable what Sony called iLink conversion, which would down convert the HDV video signal to regular standard def DV. You can even turn guide frames on, color bars, if you want to just record color bars. Playback is pretty much the same as it's always been, looks the same as it was on many of the earlier mini DV handycams, and even the Sony DCR TRV 460 and 480 digital 8 handycams that had a touchscreen interface exactly to. Uh, identical to this one and of course you could fast forward you can rewind you can play you can stop the video everything is done through the touchscreen and if you want to review the photos you've taken to the memory stick you need only press this memory button and it'll cycle through the still photos that you have taken to it if you switch this over to memory mode you can take pictures at the maximum resolution of 1920 by 1440 and all the manual controls that you'd have on their video recording are available for taking stills. Eager to see some test footage of this camcorder? Well I have a magic trick for you. You're actually looking at live test footage being recorded right from the HDR HC1 as we're currently looking at an HDR HC1. Well, as they say good things come in pairs. The HC1 is no exception. I actually have two. And the one that I'm using to record this video with right now has an issue where its firewire port is totally dead and it also likes to randomly shut off and have flights of fancy for the first minute or two on a cold startup. Something that's nice about having an older camcorder is that accessories are both plentiful and cheap. For example, if I wanted to add an additional halogen video light or a xenon flash for taking stills, I could just rob the one that's on my main camcorder I use to record all my videos with. And the reason for that is because all of the consumer HDV camcorders that Sony produced used the same hot shoe accessory shoe standard referred to as an active interface shoe. And another good thing is that my Sony wide angle conversion lens that I use with my digital 8 camcorders and my other HDV camcorders uh, that uses 37 millimeter lens threads. Just go ahead and remove the Sony supplied lens hood from the camera and screw this in place onto the lens threads. And now I've instantly converted this camcorder to have a wide field of view, something that uh, they don't really have to begin with. Now I'll remove this lens hood, and I'll remove my lens, screw that onto here without stripping the lens threads. Doing this all live. 
And now I can get a much better field of view without having to back up halfway across the room thanks to this wide-angle lens. Now these days Sony's actually pretty good about maintaining archives of manuals for their tape-based camcorders, but something they aren't so good about is maintaining archives of their literature that would accompany new camcorders, and that's what I assume this thing is. This is an accessory guide that goes over all the fancy highfalutin accessories that you too could have bought brand new at full MSRP if you had the wherewithal to do so when this camcorder was new. And uh, oh yeah, did I mention that this camcorder, the HC1, sold for $2,000? Well, if I didn't, there you go. $2,000 and you too could buy these accessories as well to really gild the lily. But to lessen the burn, there was a 15% coupon offer. <laughs> I wonder what happened if I tried using that today. Crazy seeing the prices of these things. This little BC-TRM compact battery charger for the Infolithium M-Series batteries that this camcorder uses, of course, sold for $60. As did the basic, uh, well, one tier above basic, the NP-FM30 was the bare bones battery that all the cameras came with. The FM50 was a slight upgrade over it. That sold for $60 too. And you could buy an exclusive soft carrying case at $70. A high grade deluxe carrying case for $60. A hard carrying case will really break the bank coming in at whopping $250. And then a high grade messenger style bag for your camera, $45. And there is the halogen video light in use on the HC1 in this little kind of uh, vignette. Now I could very well be wrong about this, but I don't believe that Sony ever provided firewire or iLink cables, as they like to call them, in the box with their HDV and quite possibly even their mini DV camcorders. So if you bought a new camcorder, you had to buy one. And they sold a one and a half meter iLink cable. There's two different variations. There's a 4-pin, a 6-pin, and a 4-pin, the 4-pin. $40. And the same thing goes for these high-grade component video cables and AV cables. So this little trip down memory lane was exclusively recorded with the Sony HDR HC1. What I have to find myself doing is trying to talk in the center of the camera, even though I usually want to offset it to my right side so I could look at the LCD screen a bit easier because these microphones are of such high quality and have such good stereo separation that if I hold the camera how I normally want to, you're only going to hear me in the left channel. So I have to remember to kind of center it out so that way it's more balanced. Normally I have the saturation and sharpness bumped up a bit on these uh, Handycams just to make the image a little bit better. The deinterlacing, upscaling, and upload stage of making a video. But everything has been left to its defaults in this one to give an accurate representation of the quality. So in 2005, if you were on the bleeding edge and wanted a high-definition capable camcorder, the HC1 was likely one of very few options that you had available at the time. If I'm not mistaken, the JVC GR1 was the absolute world's first HDV camcorder, but that was limited to a resolution of only 720p, whereas the HC1, of course, did do full 1080i, 1440 by 1080 video recording. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm quite impressed that 18 years later, the video quality put out by the HC1 is as good as it is, and could definitely give newer AVC HD camcorders a run for their money. Oh yeah, did I mention the fact that this has a shoulder strap that you could use to put this thing around your shoulder or around your neck to tote it around with you? You can't do that with a modern consumer camcorder. There's no provisions for attaching a lanyard. Because as they say, the best camera or camcorder is the one that you remember to bring with you. And with this thing hanging around your neck, you're never going to forget it.